So the first page is the, the study. So this you, you'll be able to keep and you'll be able to review it. Essentially, we're gathering stories from residents in Sherman Park to um, enhance the knowledge of this neighborhood. And so, yeah, we would contribute to that body of work. Risks and benefits. The risk is that um, any information that you give us will go into the pub into public space. So, um, yeah, that's that's a risk. You can retract anything that you don't want in there. You know, you can contact us at any time and say, oh, hey, I said that, I, I that can't be out there. You can take back anything that you don't want out there in the public, right? Yeah. Anything else in that? Um, so this is, you know, what was said here will not be confidential. Um, voluntary participation, so you don't have to do this. <laughs> Obviously, you, you probably understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can contact our professors, Dr. Regit Sen. Okay. Pretty, um, decent gentleman, so <laughs> if you need anything, you can ask him about it. Or if you want to, you know, retract anything, that's the person to talk to. Uh, so then... This first signature is um, where you sign and that you consent to participate okay. based on what we all just talked about. So if you want to sign on that, if you're willing to sign that yeah, part right now. Yeah, not a problem. Just reading the rest of the Okay. Episode. Yeah, no, I'm kind of rushing through it. So. Okay. So, we kind of missed something yesterday. Yes, we sent here, signed here, um, print here. Okay, so, so she signed, but then we missed this back part with the street address. So, just uh, make sure. Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I got uh, several several calls about this interview. I was also uh, contacted by uh, the Sherman Park Neighborhood uh, Resource Center up on uh, Fond du Lac, and uh, he had called me and asked me had I been contacted, and so he had asked was I going to do the interview as well. So I had been contacted by a couple of people. So you need me to sign here? Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things. Well, okay. We need, on this page, we need you to print your name. Okay. And then the next page on the top line, we'll yes. sign it. So on top of page four. permission to use we won't be using video but photo recordings if we we would really like to get a, we'd like to get a photo of you okay and then we'd also like to possibly get photos of whether it be your artwork or your some of my um, artwork yeah where you, 
the house. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Most of my uh, most of my artwork is is upstairs. Although this is a, a photograph that I did of my mother, who has passed. Those are some photographs from a photography class that I took from the of the cathedral uh, in on the south side. And uh, most of the artwork in the house is my work, except for a few pieces. That's a friend of mine's work. Uh, the wood carvings are uh, pieces that I purchased, and a friend of mine did the big face piece. And then uh, this piece in the hallway is by an artist named George Giss, and the saxophone player over there is also by George. And uh, the other pieces, the ceramic pieces, that uh, like Warrior up there, I did that uh, while I was incarcerated. And then these are photographs of my significant other and my grandchildren and godson and my granddaughters and grandsons. So most of this stuff is... Uh, and then most of my artwork is really upstairs in the attic. I have uh, a very large uh, selection of works upstairs, and then I have a large selection of uh, paintings and stuff sitting on the table. I'm in the process of remodeling my bathroom, so I just did the roof. I'm remodeling this house, and this house is 100 years old, so... I'm doing work uh, trying to restore different things and make it as comfortable as possible. That's a great. So, so wonderful. yeah. Is it possible that we could turn off the TV? Is uh, it, yeah. Because this is really sensitive, so I just want to make sure that we, we don't hear that in the background. Thank you. So we got the first one, and then Yeah. 
And this is a piece that I won the National Art Contest for called Thank You for Seeing Me as a Veteran and Not a Homeless Man in 2015. Is that the original? Uh, the original is upstairs, actually. Uh, these are prints. Uh, but uh, like this is an original piece. A lot of these pieces are original. I mean, this is a piece that I did of my mother in 04 earlier. But most of those pieces in that box are all original pieces and a lot of abstract work. And then these photos here are photos that I took in uh, the uh, photo class. Uh, I took these in New Orleans and they're from my photo class. And uh, that's a picture of my mother, which is that picture that I had over there. And then that's me peeking through a tree when we went out and then those are some different pieces that I did with this uh, my work here. I did this ceramic piece. These are friends of mine, uh, prints of uh, friends of mine uh, artwork. And then this is uh, a, a award from the regional office of the VA hospital. I'm the director of We want to capture all of this. Like yeah. this is the stuff we want to capture. Um, okay. So if you will, let's finish we'll up this. We'll just, then we'll just, yeah. Then we'll roll. We'll just do this quickly. So this is the photo. So okay. Um, if you. Then you made me to sign up here. Yeah, sign there, and then this is the date. Okay. Um, we'll take this one and you can keep this one so you can read it back over. Okay. Or, um, yeah. Make an art piece out of it or something. <laughs> 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 I don't know if it's worthy of that. That doesn't sound like too bad an idea. <laughs> It might make a good a good piece. You, uh, when you're being creative, you use all types of things. You do all different types. At least I do. I like to experiment a lot when it comes to artwork. Uh, I just find it. Uh, my art is what kind of like frees me up to to move forward in different things that I'm doing right now. I'm. Uh, I'm studying at uh, Upper Iowa University for my bachelor's degree. So uh, I was released from prison in 2015, and uh, about about July, June or July of 2015. And I came I came home and uh, I first went to the halfway house on 51st in Lisbon. And uh, I left there, and I went to sit, live in a transition house at, uh, I think there's 34th and Wales, uh, Vets Place Central. And I got into an altercation with a guy there, and I was removed from Vets Place Central. I got put out of there. And so I ended up living on the street for like about eight months. And... Although I had a job, I, I had gotten into a, a program at the VA hospital called CWT. So I had a job, and I was going to work every day and everything, but nobody knew I was homeless. 
and I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my children. Uh, I didn't really ask anybody for any help or anything. I just uh, went along as if I had a regular existence like everybody else. And then uh, about, I guess, the middle of 16, some people at the hospital talked me into entering a, a national art contest through the VA hospital, Creative Arts Festival. And so I, at first I was hesitant about putting my piece in there because uh, thank you for seeing me as a veteran and not a homeless man. I started working on the piece in Vets Place Central and I ended up finishing it in the back of my van. And so after I won that contest, Volunteers of America contacted me and uh, they did a article, interview, everything. As a matter of fact, they just dedicated a book uh, last month and uh, I, they have my story in that book to Volunteers of America, so you might could check on, look at that as well. And uh, I just started uh, working towards pursuing my dream as far as becoming a, a local artist. I met a, I met a guy named Tim John while I was living in, in the halfway house. And uh, he uh, introduced me to a group of guys which is now a Fresh Perspective Art Collective. And I, uh, I still, even none of them knew that I was homeless. Every, nobody knew, I never, never said anything about it until I won the National Art Contest through Creative Arts Festival. And then my story came out about me being homeless and having spent numerous years in prison and just pursuing my art, pursuing my dream. And then about, I guess, I guess about six months, six or seven months after uh, I won the National Art Contest, uh, I had been applying and trying to get my service-connected benefits from the VA. And I got my, I got uh, my service-connected benefits. Uh, I was diagnosed 70% disabled PTSD. And so when I got my back pay, I bought this house. So that's how I came to live in the Sherman Park area. Uh, I bought this house. I was attracted to the house because I bought it from one of the guys that I painted with. And he. I was like, I was living... Uh, I was living in an apartment building out off of uh, Fond du Lac in a hundred and, I'm, I'm going to say, a hundred and tenth. And uh, they started, uh, started raising my rent, kept raising my rent because I didn't want to re-sign a contract with them. Uh, and... Uh, so they raised my rent to about $810 a month. And so I figured, well, if I'm going to be paying $810 a month to somebody for an apartment, I might as well buy a house because that's a house note. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, if you can afford to pay $700 a month or $600 a month, that's a house note. You can afford to, to own your own property. And so I always felt my mother never raised a fool, and if I was going to spend them kind of finances to have some place to live, I might as well be purchasing it for myself instead of paying for somebody else's property. So that's how I came about buying this house, and I uh, I moved uh, I moved in here January the first of seventeen. So I've been in here a little bit over a year, almost a year and a half. Sorry to interrupt you. There's an intro thing that we were supposed to do. I know we're like pretty far in here, but right. I'll just, I'll just. Okay, do it. you can, you can go into do it. Do it for the heck of it. We have a little script, so okay. <laughs> um, today is June fourteenth, twenty eighteen, and it's now nine twenty five a.m. 
Uh, my name is Bella Beward. My partner is Kostin Tiksinski. Um, <laughs> and I am an undergraduate student at UWM. I'm studying architecture. And Kostin is a graduate student at UWM. And um, we are conducting an oral history interview of Willie Willie Weaver Willie Bay. Willie Willie Weaver Bay right at his property at um, 2542 2542 North 39th Street um, this will be a little bit of a longer interview but we're gonna um, ask you some general biographical questions uh, questions about your early life about the neighborhood and then it'll kind of progress from there okay um and we've talked about all the risks and benefits, so I think we can leave it at that. Um, okay. You talked about how you came into this home specifically. Yes. But uh, could you go back and um, talk about your early life um, and uh, your I, veteran, so some about yeah. that? I was, uh, I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri in uh, 1954. Uh, I have uh, a lot of siblings. Uh, my father had two sets of, of children. And so uh, I'm the oldest boy living of the oldest set of kids. And uh, my family is basically all over the country. I have sisters and brothers in Kansas City, Missouri. I have uh, siblings in uh, St. Louis, Texas, uh, California, Utah. So we're kind of like spread out. Uh, I... Uh, I dropped out of school and went to the military. And then after I got out of the military, I ended up in prison. And then while I was in prison, I started back going to school. I got my GED and I just wanted to educate myself. And then I met a guy named Bobby, Bobby West and he was an artist. And I used to always ask him, Bobby, teach me how to draw, teach me how to paint. He never, ever had time. So I watched him for a whole year. And I guess I pestered him a lot as well because I was always asking all kind of questions about why you do that, what does that do? What does that make the picture do? And I just told myself that I could do it, that I could do that, I could do that. And although I really didn't know what I was doing, I convinced myself that I probably could paint. And I, uh, I stuck to it. I, uh, my first pictures, I got laughed at. And I kind of guess that gave me, I'm kind of stubborn, so I guess that gave me the incentive to keep trying to paint. And of course, I was one of those hard-headed artists too because I wanted to try to learn how to do the most difficult uh, subject matter in what I feel is in, in the art field is painting portraits, is painting people. And I wanted to paint people. And guys would be like, man, you ain't ready for that. And I was like, man, how are you going to tell me what I'm ready for? I really wasn't ready for it, but I guess I was because I, I pursued it anyway. And uh, even now I'm still learning. It's a lot of trial and error. But my favorite medium is uh, pastels, and my favorite subject matter is abstract. Um, I think when you paint abstract art, it allows you to, to free yourself to... Uh, it doesn't have to have uh, a whole lot of structure, but it, in a way it really does have to have a whole lot of structure. But I feel that art is more about, more than about just painting. 
art is about life, period. It's, uh, it's your expressions of how you see things. And I just went to school. I just wanted to uh, make myself better, studied, uh, and I just kept trying to paint. And even today, I still just continue to uh, scratch at it and, and try to paint. And I, I always tell myself it's not a matter of, of if I'm going to make it in order or not. It's just a matter of when. Because, like, right now, I know probably in this house there's well over twenty five to 3,000 paintings upstairs in the attic. <laughs> so it's a lot of work up there. I have a printer up there that my cousin gave me a couple of weeks ago. And so my early childhood was ups and downs. Uh, come from a fairly large family. Uh, there were eight of us in the house. And so coming up in the, the late 50s and uh, middle 50s and early 60s, I guess it was challenging, you know. We didn't have a whole lot. My mother, uh, my mother was a cook and a domestic worker, and she uh, she provided the best that she could. She wasn't an educated lady. She left Arkansas in the twenties and and moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, so she did the best job she knew how. And uh, I, I kind of think that my choices and some of the things that I did is what landed me in prison. But I don't blame anybody for that because you, you learn to take responsibility for your own actions. Uh, I, have, uh, I have children that live all over the country. My two youngest live in Las Vegas. I have a son here that lives in Oshkosh. I have a daughter in Long Beach, California, two of them actually, in Long Beach, California. Um, and then uh, I have a son in St. Louis that uh, I know about, uh, but I've never met or seen. Uh, my mother always let me know that I had a son when I was around about 15 and a half, 16 years old. And so I guess life is, basically my life has been what I've made it. Uh, I'm not ashamed of anything that I did because I think it made me a better person. Uh, I find that I'm, I'm responsible and that I take responsibility for my actions. I'm presently still on parole uh, until next year. I'll be done with that. And actually, I was sent to Wisconsin, I think, to fail. But if st instead of failing, be I, I thrive because most guys that are released from prison after doing over 20 years don't last very long in the street. They're usually back in prison within six or eight months of being released. And uh, I just choose to never go back to prison, and I would rather be shot down like a dog in the street than spend one day in jail, literally. And so that's my attitude about that. So I work real, real hard not to break the law or put myself in a position where somebody can place me in that type of situation again and have that kind of control over my life, the way that the prison system has control over people's lives. So I went back to school. I got an AA in environmental technology, and I got wastewater license through Pima College in Arizona while I was incarcerated. And I've continued my education since then. So when I, uh, I moved to the Sherman Park area because although things are kind of rough and rowdy right now, this was once a prominent area and the history of this area is really, really rich. But also this area sits right in the midst of a regentrification zone. 
and a lot of people don't realize that we're 15 minutes from downtown and a lot of people who had moved out of this area and into Brown Deer and different places and uh, areas further outside of Milwaukee, uh, like uh, I, I would say uh, Richfield and stuff like that. A lot of those people want, now that they've built the new stadium and everything, a lot of those people want to come back into the, get closer to the stadium and everything. So actually this area now is prime real estate, whether most people who live in this area realize it or not. Uh, I would say that within the next five to seven years, the the makeup of this area and the way that it looks will be drastically changed. They will come in and they will buy this property back up and they'll boot bill where the lots are empty and they will build back up the little areas on uh, Center and North Avenue where the stores and everything is. And this is going to return back to the prominent area that it was. And a lot of the houses in this area were built very, very well. So they have real, real, real good bones to come in and re restore them and renovate them and uh, bring this area back. And the property taxes in this area will probably go up exponentially, and it'll push a lot of people out who can't afford to pay the property taxes. So a lot of people will probably lose their homes because of the property taxes, and a lot of people will get offers for their homes and have never really had any money, so they'll jump at the first deal, and they'll sell out, and they'll move out, and they'll re this area. Uh, I've already started getting calls about, about can I make an offer on your home? Do you want to sell your house? So I bought this house because of where it, the location, where it's located, understanding uh, about regentrification in other areas like Los Angeles, New York, Harlem, so and understanding the dynamics of that. I knew that buying this property, while the price was low in the place that I bought it, should I decide to sell, will pay dividends later on down the line. However, I have no intention of selling. When everybody else is probably moving out and going, I'll probably still be sitting here. That's why I'm investing funds into restoring and rebuilding the house now. All of the stuff that you see leaning against the wall, all of that is for the bathroom. That is the uh, sheetrock for the bathroom, the vanity, the toilets over there, the tiles over there, the lights is over there, the uh, apparatus for a barn door is over there, and I'm doing everything out of pocket, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. but. I know that this area is going to come back, and areas change. And a lot of people in this area now are not homeowners, they're renters. And so a lot of the people that own a lot of the houses over here, when they start coming in and making the right kind of offers, they're going to sell this property. They're going to sell it right off from under the renters. And they won't have any place to go, and they will have to leave. And so. I feel that being this close to downtown, it's a prime area, and there's a lot of things going on. But Sherman Park, if you go back and you do the research, the history of Sherman Park, when the, the, the Polish people were here, the Germans were here in this area, this was, and the, the factory workers from R.E. Swartz, and that's when people start moving into this area because there's areas here in Milwaukee where Blacks weren't allowed across a certain street. So I didn't just move here on a whim without doing any research. Most people just move someplace and just move. But I actually went and looked at what was going on, looked at where I'm sitting at, how the property value fell, and now how it's starting to, to inch up. And then every time that you do something to your home, that increases the value of that. 
when you start doing stuff on the outside aesthetics of the house, when you start putting on siding, you start putting in plants, you start doing different things to beautify the house, then that raises the value. And so in understanding that, I know what I have, I know what I'm sitting on, and I know where I'm sitting at. And so most people in this area have not taken any of those things into account as to why they're in Sherman Park or what Sherman Park once was. And it's starting to change. Some of these houses now are selling for fifty and 60000 And probably five years ago, you could have got a lot of these houses for under 20000 So I, I understand the dynamics of what's going on. And, and I think that they're going to revitalize this area. And the people who have to stay in power are going to have a nice nest egg and a nice piece of property. And I plan to be amongst that group. <laughs> uh, there's no reason for me to leave and go anywhere. Plus, this house in California, this exact same house, if I could take my house right now and pick it up and move it and buy a piece of land in California and move it to California would be worth seven, eight hundred thousand dollars because this is what they call California-style bungalow because of all of the built-in wood and everything. So these houses were constructed with something, and when they first built these houses, they used plaster. So they don't have the thin pasteboard walls and stuff. So if you find one of these houses that's got some good bones, and it's still holding on to some of its old structure and stuff. It was built real well, built very well. This house has really good bones. And so uh, I realized what I have. And like you don't, you don't find houses with all of the trim and wood in the ceiling and different stuff like that anymore. You, you don't find them. And so, I mean, you know, like in my dining room area, the, that lights up. Those uh, Each corner has a light. That's how this house was designed 100 years ago. So all of this built-in wood is the original wood that was in this house when it was built. And it needs to be uh, sanded and scripted down and restained. But uh, that, as you can see in the foyer here, uh, me and my significant other, we redid the doors, the original door, and uh, we re we restained this this foyer and everything. We stripped it down and redid it, and so this is uh, this is the original tile that was put in this house when it was first built. So I, I realized all of this is all of this behind the couch is built in wood. And it's got a storage space up under that you can lift it up and you can store blankets or whatever yeah. in there. So I just realized what I have and I, I want to keep it. I plan on uh, taking my time and doing a little bit here, a little bit there, and restoring the house and just making it comfortable. Because I know that this, this uh, people change areas. But the area can can change because usually the when the prices start to go up and everything, all of the riffraff will usually move out because they can't afford to live there. And that's what's going to happen to this area. It's going to be revitalized and regentrified. And that's why they're putting so much money in this area now and giving grants for people to try to fix their houses up and and everything. You know, so like I, I see myself being here when all of the changes take place. Like most people don't have, I, I just purchased that window. That's for the bathroom to replace the bathroom window and go with the block glass. I had to have that custom made because of the size of it and everything. But I don't feel that any investments that I make into my home will be in vain. Whatever I put into this house, I'll get it I'll get it back out in use 
or if I'm if if I made an offer that I can't refuse, I'll get it back out and sell. And so, it's a win-win situation as far as I see it. I think that uh, right now Sherman Park is an area that's on the rise. There's a there's a lot of crime. There's a lot of um, gang activity. That, but there's a lot of people that hang in this area that don't live in this area. So they come and do their dirt over here, and then they go where they live at, and they go, and it may not be as bad. So you see a lot of that. Um, you see we have a lot of gunshots in the area, and... Uh, they had a couple of killings and shootings and stuff. But that could happen anywhere in the country. I mean, when something, if somebody gets killed in, in Brookfield, you don't hear nothing about it because they don't broadcast it on the news. But if somebody gets killed on 35th Street, it's all over the news. So there's that double standard. Uh, when... Uh, uh, a child in this area is exceptional in school and does something really, really noteworthy. You don't hear a lot of things about it. You don't hear a lot of the accolades. You might hear it from the family members or something like that, but it's not broadcast as much versus if a child does something outstanding in Wauwatosa or Brookfield, then we're going to know about it because they're going to put it on the news. So I, I look at all of that and, and, to, and the standard of there's, there's a, a two-tiered system in this country. There's that tier for you guys, and then there's the tier for us. And so I, uh, I have a friend of mine named Adam, and he did a painting down in Black Cat Alley. And... Uh, his painting got vandalized and they painted over it and I mean just really and so uh, we did an interview about his painting uh, I did an interview on Here and Now with Fred Trieger Freiberg and uh, my attitude was why do I have to be a black artist or a white artist why, why we just can't be artists you know why do we always have to have this dividing line or this separating line of, of, of cultures. And, and yeah, cultures are different and the way that we are raised and the, the things that we do are different. But at the end of the day, there's only one family and that's the human family, you know? So I see things a little bit different than most people probably here. I see things for this area probably a lot different than most people that live in this area right now. Because most people that live in this area right now don't realize that they're living in a regentrification zone. Most people that live in this area don't re realize that they're trying to revitalize this area and regentrify this area and push them out. You know, they have no idea. So if somebody comes and offers them 30000 for a house, they think that's a lot of money. And all actuality and essence, it's not a lot of money at all. And most of them, if they got $30,000, they wouldn't go back and repurchase the house. They would spend it on all kind of other frivolous things. So we aren't taught how to manage money. We aren't taught how to value property because property is one of the few things that you can attain in this country that has any kind of staying power. You just gotta be able to hang in there when the times get tough. And so I understand all of that because when I was incarcerated, all I did was read and study. I just, I would read books. I would just read and read and I would look at all kinds of different things. And so I wasn't reading the, the average novel, the average guy that's in prison is, is reading uh, the Hood novel and everything. I was reading uh, Shake Anti Diop, Theophile Banger, uh, uh, Tony Browder, 
uh, Francis Cress Welling, Ben Jacana. These are, are, are black historians who talk about uh, J.A. Rogers, who uh, wrote a three-volume book, Sex and Race. It took him 35 years to write three volumes. Uh, I read about people like Ahmed Baba, uh, the, the University of San Corre. Uh, I, I re-educated myself because when I went to prison, I was a functioning illiterate. I thought I could read, and I was pronouncing words, but I didn't have no comprehension. So I taught myself how to comprehend. Uh, so the things that I see for this area, the average person probably won't see. And most of them won't even have a vision or know that I see this way because I won't talk to them or they don't talk to me because they don't know me. Because when I get off work, I come in my house. I don't hang out and I don't, you know, I don't go to the clubs. The, the, the so-called fun things that most people think that they're doing because there's no value in it. And if there's no value in something, why do it? Um, I like to think that I'm a progressive thinker, but I have to look at the climate of the country as well and what's going on in politics. And most people say, well, oh, I don't care nothing about no politics. That ain't got nothing to do with me and not realizing that politics affects every phase of their life. And so if you don't understand that and you don't have any knowledge that that affects every phase of your life, then you'll look at it and brush it off and say, oh, that ain't got nothing to do with me. When in essence, it has everything to do with you. Because whichever way the political climate goes, so goes the country. And that's why we're, we're living in such devastating times now with the president that we have in office right now because we have never had a president in office who's a pathological liar and a narcissist. He's narcissistic. Everything it has to be made about him. I'm the only one that can solve the problem. And uh, I got the, 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 the job rate down to the lowest it's ever been. Obama labored for that for the whole eight years that he was in office. Now he's seeing the residuals of it because he just came into office. But he hasn't did any groundwork. But most people don't look at that and see it from that perspective. So somebody that's a student, or somebody that's uh, uh, studying for their doctorate or their thesis, they understand what's going on. That's why so many women are voting against his policies and what he's doing because he cares nothing about women. What man would get on national TV and say, yeah, my, my daughter's a beautiful hunk of... It's absurd, you know? So I, I, I know that this area is going to bounce back. And it, this, was a, this was a great area. They had a lot of commerce in this area, on North Avenue, on Center, on Fond du Lac, and all of that stuff, all of this property right now is, is dirt cheap. You can get one of these houses, 25, 30 grand. That's not a lot of money. Most people spend that jerking off a year. You know, They don't realize that they're spending that much money because they're spending it a, a hundred at a time. But what if you could save that hundred at a time? So I see things differently. I understand the value of property. My great-grandfather had 500 acres of land in Arkansas, and he was a slave. And in 1869, 1870, he had 500 acres of land. So somebody taught him the value of owning land. He couldn't read and write. He had a mark. I got papers in my file cabinet in there on a 1920-something census about my family. I've got a copy of my, what my grandfather gave, a section of a section of an acre to each one of his kids. And so if he could do that five years out of slavery, because he was emancipated in 1865, then why can't I be successful 
because the same thing and the same genes that flow through his blood that made him understand the value of property is not already in me because I can't change my bloodline. So that is in me to do good, to be great, to do the right things. Every week, I give anywhere from between 60 and 100 bags of clothes away to different organizations around the city for homeless people because I was homeless, because I found a means. I get the overflow of donated clothes from an organization, and then I turn around and I take it and I go out and I redistribute it to churches, to people who don't have a lot of clothes. And a lot of times the stuff be brand new, sometimes it's used. But people are in such dire straits and are in such need. And so, if, and I, I don't do it for, for any kind of accolades or anything that I'm going to get back from it. I do it because I understand what it's like to be without, to have to sleep in the street, to not be able to have a, a, a decent pair of pants to put on or to have to keep watching the same old pair of pants uh, three, four times a week to make sure that it's clean. So I have a thing about making sure that I have plenty of food in the house, making sure that I have plenty of water in the house, uh, making sure that I have plenty of clothes because I look at the examples of Katrina. I look at the examples of Puerto Rico and I can't depend on if we have a natural disaster, the government doing anything for me. I can't wait for them to, to, to get into this area to bring me some water. So I keep anywhere from nine to 10 cases of water at all times. I keep my freezers full of food so that I can make sure that if something happens, I can feed myself. I don't trust the government, I, and, and I have a distrust of the government for several reasons. I can look at the Tuskegee Institute uh, uh, ex as an example. I can look at Katrina as an example. I can look at Puerto Rico and how people of color suffer every time that, that there's something. People that live in New Orleans, a lot of people from the Third Ward and from Katrina will never be able to move back to New Orleans. And not only did they, they do that, but now they've went in and they've started regentrifying the area and they've outpriced them so they can't afford to move back there. They will never be, and a lot of them lost their homes and their homes were taken under eminent domain because they went in and raised everything and tore it down and took the land. So these are lessons and examples that we as a people should learn and take note of. But because we don't think that politics affects us, we ignore it. We don't see it. We can't see that far down the road. And visionaries are those people who see far down the road and they are able to create something and come up with something and then that enriches them for generations and generations and generations. This house, the way I have it set up, is that as long as one of my kids or one of my grandkids is alive, it can never be sold unless I elect to sell it. And I think that's how it should be with property because it takes so much and it's so hard to get it. So. My life lessons, man, prison taught me a lot. And I don't think if had I not went, gone to prison and spent as much time in prison as I did, that I would be the person that I am today. Uh, it taught me the value of taking responsibility for my actions and not blaming others for what happened to me. Being homeless taught me that it's a feeling that I don't ever, ever, ever want to experience again. Uh, I remember I was being transferred from one prison to another, and I was taken to a 
receiving holding service center in El Reno, Oklahoma. And it was raining. I mean, like you could barely see it was raining so hard. And they made us come off the bus and stand in the rain for like three hours with our nose facing a fence. And they told you, don't turn around, don't look around. And they were shoving people's heads into the fence and shoving people's heads into the wall because guys were getting restless. They were trying to see around them. And they told us, you had air El Reno, Oklahoma, America. And I never felt so helpless in my life. And I told myself if I ever get out of prison, because I had a long sentence, if I ever, ever get out of prison, I would never allow anyone to have that kind of control over my life ever again. That I would rather be dead than to allow somebody to cage me up like an animal like that. And I was incarcerated for over 30 years. So this is my little nest egg. And I got everything in it. I got sweat equity in this house because I've tried to do some things myself. I got all my little finances that I get tied up in this house because I'm restoring it 90% out of pocket. And so I can't afford to get everything at one time, so I have to buy these few items, and then the next month I have to buy this, and the next month I have to buy that. That's how. I, that's why all this stuff is sitting in here, because I had to buy it piece by piece, a little bit at a time. But as long as I got a breath in me, I'm going to restore this house. And it may take me five years, it may take me ten years, I don't know how long it's going to take me, but I ain't going nowhere because this is where I decided that I was going to make my home. And I don't care if they raise the taxes where the taxes is $10,000 a year. I'm going to find some kind of way to pay it. If I had to pay it a little bit at a time, and I'm going to be right here, I ain't going nowhere. So that's what a Sherman Park means to me. Uh, watching people move in and move out and just sitting back and watching the area change. When I first moved into this area, there weren't that many businesses on center. Now you're seeing all these little shops, these little daycares, these little restaurants, these little, everybody's trying to open something up. Those are the people that got vision to see that this is coming back, and they're trying to dig in. And they're trying to buy these buildings and be there. And the same thing is happening on North Avenue. The same thing is happening on Lisbon. The same thing is happening on Valique. Going all the way to National. Now, if Marquette had their way, they would buy that whole area over there. And wouldn't nobody be over there but Marquette. But the city won't allow it. Because everything that they can buy, they have bought. Or they are buying and they are building. And they're not building for no reason. They're building because they're regentrifying the area. All of the new high rises downtown past Water Street, over towards Walnut in the new stadium, how they pushed all of that out to build them. That's regentrification at work. And what that does is that raises the property taxes, that raises the property value, and those who have to stay in power and the knowledge to see what's going on, going to be all right if they can hang in there. And those who can't, they're going to get pushed out. So do you think redentrification is a good or bad thing for this neighborhood? It has its good points. And it has its bad points. Because a lot of the people that live here now have raised their kids in this area, have been here for 15, 20, 25 years. And in another 10 years, they're not going to be able to afford to live over here. 
So that's the negative of it. But the positive of it is it revitalizes an area to bring it back to its natural glory and what it once was. And my advice to people that read these articles or look at your stories or your, your that they, they read these articles with a critical eye and go and do the research on the history of Sherman Park. Go and do the research on Brownsville. Did you know about Sherman Park before you were placed in Milwaukee? No, absolutely not. But I just, I'm a, a, a student, I'm a studier. So I'm a student, so when you go into somewhere, you start to look at things. You need to start to investigate, start to study. What do you see? You know, uh, somebody may, may come and make an offer that I can't refuse. They might come in and say, hey, listen, uh, we want this house, and we realize you've been redoing this and redoing that, but here's $250,000. Well, would I turn that down? I don't think so. I would take that because I could go and go to another area and do what I need to do and have to seed money for another home and to go in and, and renovate or whatever. So would I turn that kind of money down? I don't think so, although I understand what it is. But then again, I might turn it down because that $250,000 might look real, real good right now. But in 15 years, this house might be worth a half a million. So you got the, there's the pros and the cons. And that's the same thing with regentrification. There's the pros and the cons. Does it help the, 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 the neighborhood? In a lot of ways it will. Because it's going to run the riffraff out. And so when you run the riffraff out, what happens then is they come in and the city repairs the streets. So you ain't got all these humps and dumps in the street because the property value is going up and the people are paying more taxes. So then if the people are paying more taxes and the property value goes up, then there's, no, there's more police patrols. There's more keeping the unwanted out of the area. So once that happens, yeah, that's a good thing. That's a real good thing. But who does it hurt along the way is what you have to look at. So you had said earlier that you don't talk to many people in the community? I talk to a lot of people in the community. Uh, we have a neighborhood, a neighborhood watch. We got people that stay across the alley from me. They're involved with uh, neighborhood meetings. I go to the meetings down at the 38th Street School. Uh, I uh, they, they had an incident in right outside of the house here. And so the police came and knocked on the door. And she said, well, we noticed that you have cameras. Can we view your cameras? And I was like, of course. Why would I not let you view them? Because the safety, if they bring safety, that safety is not only for those out there, that safety is for me too. Yeah, I talked to my neighbor across the street I talk to my neighbor in the back alley, talk to my neighbor down the street, but I'm not, but those are the people that are homeowners and they're involved in what's going on in the neighborhood. But I don't talk to the people that don't care nothing about the neighborhood that'll drive down the street and pull right in front of my house and take the trash bag and dump it out in front of my house. I don't got no words for them because all that's gonna create is a backwards and forward diet tribe which may turn into something else. Be simply because I asked, would you please not leave your trash in front of my house? Because just because we live over here doesn't mean that it has to look like that over here. If, if you notice when you came up, I got plastic bags hanging on my railing so I can keep picking up the trash because it blows, it's not my trash, it blows from down the street constantly. So I'm cleaning up somebody else's trash. I'm sweeping, I, I get a, a broom and sweep from almost the corner all the way down because I want my area to look like somebody lives here and cares. 
but everybody doesn't care. Why do you care for your neighborhood? I care for my neighborhood because I would like to know that it could be better. And I care for my property because I understand that when you take care of your property, then it increases the value. And any increase in property value is a good thing if you understand value. But that's the problem with a lot of the people that live here is they don't know what they value. So what are your values? What kind of values did you get instilled in you? Or what kind of values have you taken on since you realized that value has some worth? So I care about my neighborhood because it's where I live and I want it to be a good, safe place for the children and for people to raise their families without fear of somebody coming in and breaking into their their, their property. Uh, I mean, I've had several incidents since I've been here. The other morning, I, I came home from work and somebody had described planting five rose bushes. Somebody had threw uh, a, a, a piece of concrete slab and broke the rose bush and was trying to pull the other rose bushes up out of the ground, had big holes next to each one of them, you know? And, I mean, I've had my car vandalized. Uh, I've had people go into my car. I've had people, I, when I was first moving here, I had somebody steal my laptop out of the U-Haul truck. And the guy across the street watched him do it and didn't say anything to me and saw me moving in. And then after the guy had gotten away, then he said, oh, man, somebody went in your truck. I said, wow, what kind of neighbor is this? But that's because that's what his values are. He has no values. I used to remember thinking that, man, why would I want to call the police on anybody after enduring and having suffered what I've suffered? But sometimes people don't leave you no choice, you know? It doesn't make you want to, to, to be a participant in what they, they call uh, snitching or whatever you want to call it, whatever la label you want to put on it. But how much do you value being safe or having what you're what you, what you struggling and scraping to, to, to get together? How much do you want it to be safe? So you have to ask yourself the question, do I or don't I? And so I just figured I'll let the cameras do what they're supposed to do. And if they come and ask for the cameras, I'm going to turn them over to them. It's just that simple because I want my stuff to be safe. Walk us through like a typical day, like what you do on a daily basis. Um, on a on a daily basis, I use the uh, I get up every morning. I I come in from work usually around three thirty four o'clock in the morning, and I'll lay down for a couple of hours, and then usually I get back up around about six something, and I will go and pick up one of my coworkers who doesn't have a way to work and I'll give him a ride to work and I'll sign in and out for my day because I work the third shift. However, I have to sign in during the daytime because there's nobody there at night for me to sign in to. So I'll go back and I will sign in and then I will come back home. If I have appointments and things to do, I will go and attend to the business that I have to take care of. I wash my car a lot. I get ribbed about that a lot from my significant other about washing the car so much. But uh, I wash my car a lot, so I may, sometimes when I get off work, I'll go wash my car before I come home. And uh, I'll come home and I'll probably fall asleep on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, depending on my school schedule. I go to school, this quarter I go to school uh, when, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. So on school days, 
I come in and I'll get my books out and I'll sit here and I do my homework. And uh, I try to keep my grades up. I just made the dean's list, so I try to keep my grades up. I'll be digging in. I'll be tired sometimes. But uh, I, I dig in and I try to do what I got to do. And then I'll get up and I'll do a little running around. I might go grocery shopping or do things for the household. Or I, if I have a load of clothes, I'll go and find uh, different places where I give them to uh I go down on Valite across from the welfare office and I give them clothes there. And then I got a church that I give over on uh, Concordia. Then I may go down on Lisbon in uh, 17th and I'll give some clothes there. And if I see people that look like they just need some clothes, I'll be like, hey, you need some clothes. And I'll give clothes there, you know. I, I guess it's just in me to try to help people. I don't know. I don't know what it is about me, but when I see people, I can't stand I'm real sensitive. I can't stand to see people suffer. And I guess because I've been there, it, it, uh, I'm always giving somebody a ride. I don't know what, what's, what's with that thing, but I'm always giving somebody a ride. I'll see people look like they're struggling, barely making me. I'll be like, you need a ride? I drop, give them a ride and drop them off, you know. Yeah, I got a couple of buddies that I met through work that uh, one of them, he lives alone, and it's just him and his dog. So I'll go and check on him. Sometimes we'll go fishing, uh, but I, I try to keep up with him. And then I got another buddy. His car is down, so I make sure he gets to work. That's typical. That's my typical day. That and falling asleep. <laughs> because it seems like I can fall asleep anywhere. <laughs> so that's pretty much my day. Do you take classes through UWM? Uh, no, I'm going, my, my classes are through Upper Iowa University across from State Fair. Uh, usually most people that go to uh, voc rehab at, at the VA, they uh, a lot of the students through voc rehab at the VA, go to uh, Upper Iowa University. What are you studying? Uh, I'm, uh, my major is business administration with a minor in entrepreneurship. Um, I decided that I wanted to, to get a bachelor's degree because I want to open my own art gallery, my own art business. And so in wanting to do that, I feel like you, I'm self-taught. I never had classes. I never went to school for art or anything like that. I just feel that, like you need some kind of credentials. And so I think that's very, very important. But my ultimate goal is to get one of these old houses in the neighborhood and take it and gut it and turn it into an art center for the kids right in the neighborhood where they have some place to come and do something positive and constructive and learn every phase of art from printing to uh, acrylics, pastels, oil, watercolor, mixed media, ceramics, framing. Uh, I would just like to, to be in a position to give disadvantaged troubled children an opportunity to find that there's another way to go outside of putting yourself in a situation to go to prison. That's my ultimate goal is to have a school and teach. I think that I might be a better teacher than I am an artist <laughs> because I enjoy the interaction with the kids and everything. Uh, I have a project coming up right here where we're going to do a mural down here on the end of the corner on the uh, garage there and the children are going to do the design. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to meet today. I haven't heard, uh, heard from Miss Sherry yet, but we're supposed to meet today. And I just, I just want to give back to my, to my community because I, I feel like when I w went to, uh, here she is here, when I went to jail that I, uh, I did a lot of damage to the community. Miss Sherry? 
I'm I'm good. I'm in the middle of an interview, but as soon as I finish, I will call you, and then uh, with UWM, and then I will uh, we'll do what we're gonna do with the kids. Okay. Okay, I got Wayne here right now. What time should I tell him? Uh, get I guess give me a couple of hours. I okay. should be done okay. in a couple of hours. Okay. Could you be okay like twelve, Wayne? Would it be better? It's good. Okay, he said it's tight. He okay. Said it's Okay, so I, I. But the landlord is here, so call me back. I'll, I'll okay, yeah. Time. I'm trying to talk to him. All right, talk okay. to you then. Okay. All right, bye bye. All right, all right. Is that Sheriff Good Club? Yes. Yeah, we work Yeah, so, yeah, so that's. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. But that, <laughs> Sherry is my, my neighbor. Her and her husband live right across from me here in the back. And so I'm involved with Miss Sherry and working with the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, she came to me and she was like, uh, could you uh, work with your kids on it? And I was like, of course. Why wouldn't I? This is my community. This is where I live. And I want it to be the best community that it can be. I can't explain why I care. I just do. Um, sorry. Um, we'll continue talking about the caring thing. But where do you work? I work at the VA hospital. Uh, I'm the resident painter at the VA hospital. Right now I have a project of painting 10 floors, murals on 10 floors. So I'm in the process of doing the third mural of the 10 that I have to do. And uh, the one I'm working on now is Buffalo Soldiers, about Buffalo Soldiers. I have did one of... Uh, on Lincoln, and then I did another one called In Honor of the Flag. I have photographs of them in my phone. The Lincoln one is on that uh, picture from the uh, VA. That's uh, where they did a photo shoot and signing with me on that. Um, so you said that you work with kids. A little bit about your is it your wife? Uh, my significant your other. Significant other. How yeah. You, how you met? Oh wow! We have known each other for well over thirty years, and we met in California. We met in uh, San Diego, California, through mutual friends, and. Uh, we have been together on and off for a lot of years. We decided uh, that about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, that we wanted to rekindle our relationship after I got, I got home. And so we decided that we would give it a try. And so that's what we did. <laughs> We just, we're, we're, we're so much alike, uh, but most important, we're friends. I think that uh, she's always been there for me. She's a beautiful person. Uh, she's, uh, she retired from uh, San Diego State. She worked in... Uh, academia for a lot of years, uh, science, uh, in science labs and different stuff, and we just clicked. Uh, she's another one of the reasons why I, uh, I do what I do as far as this house is concerned, because it's always been our dream to to be together and have a place here and have a second home somewhere else. So she's between living here in Milwaukee and New Orleans. 
and I have a gallery in New Orleans that represents my work. So it's it just works. It's a win-win. And uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, has been done as far as the woodwork and everything and the stenciling of that uh, mandala on the door and everything, that's her work. And I don't know what I would do without her, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. And there she is on my pictures up there. That's her with me in that black suit. And that's us together right there. In that picture, uh, we were uh, down in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we went to see her uh, nephew's first child. And uh, she's... Uh, She's what keeps me motivated to keep pushing forward. She's been very instrumental in my uh, recovery of never going back to prison because she wouldn't she wouldn't wait around and I wouldn't want her to. Uh, but I have no desire to go back to prison because it's a dead end street, and so we just we just click. She, uh, when I'm stuck on homework, she's a great help. <laughs> she won't do it for me, but she'll send me to different directions. She makes me work. And so it works for us because I know that I got to show and prove. But, uh, yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I found out yesterday that I had made the dean's list again this year. I made the dean's list last year. And so I really worked real, real hard on trying to keep my grades up. And a lot of times I wouldn't have been able to do it without her. She is very, very determined to make sure that I make it, which keeps me motivated. That's great. I'm sorry. I have one more thing to ask, and then you can go. Um, uh, can I just ask, what are your favorite things about the community? This could be places, people, characteristics. Uh, one of my favorite things about the neighborhood is how much Miss Sherry Fuqua and her husband care about what's going on in our neighborhood. Her and O uh, they were I was in the alley one day when I when I met her husband and we started talking about taking care of you. I was out there cutting the grass or something to clean it up. And he was like, man, I see you care about your property. And I was like, yeah, man. So we need to get together and get out of here in this alley and clean this alley up. And since then, we've been out in the alley several times cleaning up and we've... Uh, met with a group of people and taking bags, trash bags and stuff, and cleaned up block by block. And so my favorite thing about this area is that I know what it once was, and I know that it's going to come back to that. I would say that's my favorite thing about the area. The negatives right now is that I wish they would get all of these renters and riffraff out who don't care enough about where they live to even clean up the yard. I think that's the worst thing in the world for your trash to be blowing all the way down the street to land up in my yard. <laughs> so I think that's one of the drawbacks is that we have a, um, I'll say an element who doesn't really care about the neighborhood. And if we could remove that, that element there, I think we would have a really, really nice neighborhood. So I think he's going to take charge. He has some more specific questions. Um, when you say take, <clears throat> when you say take the elements out of the neighborhood, my mind goes to those people being displaced. But yet, when you talk about what you're going to do for the children and building the art gallery, yeah. You obviously want. You want more. You want. You want. 
the, the element is not people being displaced. The element is the people that don't live over here, but they are over here every day being destructive in the neighborhood. That's the element. The element doesn't live here. They just hang here. That's a difference. The people that live here that are a part of that, they haven't been taught. The only way that you change something is, is through example. When they see it changing, when they see the neighborhood changing, when the children have some place to go where they can be safe without worrying about hearing gunshots or having to duck, then that makes a difference. Then the people, if, if, if every day my neighbor sees me cleaning up my yard, sooner or later that's going to rub off. He's going to be like, he be, maybe I might want get to some, get some of this paper up. I did this house next door. They just did the roof. But prior to them doing the roof, it looked horrible. After I did my roof, then they did the roof. That's the difference. It's leading by example. So if I'm out there doing the grunt work, and you keep seeing me do the grunt work, and you are living inside of seeing me do the grunt work every day, that's going to rub off. If it doesn't rub off on you, it's going to rub off on the children. And once it rubs off on the children, the children make the parent change. That's the difference. That's the element I'm talking about. When you talk about who is your mother? Oh man, wow. That is Miss Verna Weaver. And my mom was not very educated, but we weren't always close, me and my mother. But after I went to prison and I got all of those years, my mother was always there. And all my mother used to ask me, my mother uh, ended up with uh, uh, dementia. And all the way until she passed, every time I would call home and talk to her after she got dementia, she always asked me one question. Are you gonna come and get me when you get home? And my answer was always, as soon as I get there, nothing would stop me from coming and getting you, mama. And my mother's sister, my Aunt Alma. My aunt died one day and my mother died the next day. So they died a day apart in the same hospital. And my baby sister, who lives in Texas now, she lost her home and everything taking care of my mother. And so my mother meant everything to me. I wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. I wasn't allowed to have any closure. I wasn't allowed to grieve. And that's why she sits where she sits, to remind me that every time I come in that door, not to ever let anybody put me in that kind of position again. I could not say enough good things. About my mother. What did she instill? But she instilled some values in me. That if you work hard, that things would turn around. I didn't always think that if you work hard, things would turn around. I was always 
looking for that quick hustle, that quick dollar. But she taught me that a working man has a reason to have money. And my mother worked very hard her whole entire life. So all of the bad things that were in me had nothing to do with my mother. It was the things that I learned in the street because that's where I grew up at, in the street. Uh, I'm welfare raised. I grew up on surplus cheese and uh, I remember we used to have to hide the iron if it was new or put things in the closet and under the bed when I was growing up because she was on public assistance to help ends meet. So, but she did the best that she could. She wasn't educated, but my mother had a lot of mother wit. And some people have a lot of education and no mother wit, no common sense. And my mom was full of all of that. So, the things that she instilled, with me, instilled in me is that I didn't have to steal, that I didn't have to cheat, but I mean, you know, we go on our own paths as we grow and get older. But all of those things that she taught me are coming back into play now because I don't have to do any of that. When I don't have something, I do without. But I work hard for what I have. I work really, really hard for everything that I have. And that's what my mother taught me. She taught me honesty because she was honest. She taught me that you could do and be whatever you want to be in life if you work for it. So that's, what, that's what's in me now. That's what I, I think of when I see my mother. I see the cross on the wall. Is there a spiritual element to your life that is important? And, and I am a Moorish American. <laughs> but in my Quran, it says these lessons are for those who love Jesus. And spirituality is very important. There's a difference between spirituality and religion, though. And most people equate them as being synonymous with one another, when in fact they aren't. And so, I may not be very religious, but I'm definitely very spiritual, because I believe that there's something greater than me. There's something that created all of this, the atmosphere, the, the balance. The only thing that's out of balance with nature is man because everything else is in balance and harmony with nature. Everything is in balance. And when it gets out of balance, we have natural disasters. That's when the elements tip the scale. But as long as everything is balanced, everything, the flowers, the animals, the trees, everything, is in balance to survive with other things. Man is the only thing that's not in harmony. What does harmony among humanity or the balance in humanity, what does that look like in your eyes? Oh, wow. I think harmony and the balance in life with man would be that the only savior of the world is love. And when we as a people, as a human family, learns to love one another and get rid of all of the cliches and the taught uh, negative values, then man will be at peace and at one with the universe because we're not at one with each other. That's why we have all of these prejudices and I don't like them, and they don't like us, and 
we're superior to them and they don't know that. I think that the only thing that's going to save any of us is love. Love is the savior of the world. And that's what the world needs. We've heard a lot of songs. What uh, Dionne Warwick, what the world needs now is love. And that's the savior of the world. And spirituality and religion and everything takes love. Love for humanity, love for mankind, love for your neighbor. That's the only thing that's going to save us. And we haven't gotten there yet. That's how I feel. Do you have hope for the future? Absolutely. Where do you see us in 10 years? In 10 years, I see a drastic change. I, I, uh, we're, we're, at the, we're at the lowest low right now, as far as I'm concerned, in society, with the separatism and the hatred and all the vitriol and everything. I think we're at the lowest low. So when you bottom out, there's only one way to go, and that's up. And we're at the bottom of the barrel right now. We are seeing some things that has never been seen before in politics, in separatism, in hatred, in vitriol. We are seeing some things that have never been seen before. So the only thing that it can do is turn around. It's got to change. If George Bush had did one third of what in the White House as what is going on in the White House right now, the Democratic Party would have been up in arms. They would have went crazy. If Obama had it did one thing that Trump has did, they would have been ready to take him out and lynch him. Just one thing, not this consistent scream of lies and uh, he says there's no collusion. Nobody holds up the enemy in the manner in which this man has held up all of the dictators of the world. We're not just going to say Putin. He is enamored with all dictators who have a steel clamp on their people and the people of that country can't get rid of them. They presidents for life. They change the, the, the democracy as far as voting is concerned and all these. He's enamored with that of wanting to be the president for life. Obama couldn't have got away with not one thing that he has done. Not counting all of the lying every day. Every day. I, I watch the news religiously. And every day this man tells a different lie. Until he doesn't even, he begins to believe the lies himself. If I could have viewed the evidence that they had against me before I went to trial, I wouldn't have went to jail. Here's a man in the White House that has ordered to out the source who was trying to find out if Russia was trying to help him. He want to see what they got on him. He's trying to order to see what they have on him so he can defend himself. What did we do to Nixon when he did that? He was gone like, oh, one day I'm, I'm the president and the next day Ford was having to try to pardon him to keep him from going to jail. So yes, I have hope. Yes, I believe it's going to change. But the only thing that is going to change any of the conditions that are going on right now is that people open their eyes and look at the truth for what it is because truth is the only thing that never changes. The truth is the truth today and it'll be the same truth 2,000 years from now. It won't change. 
And the one thing about truth is, once you tell the truth, you ain't got to worry about if you got to remember it or not. You got to try to remember a lie. But with truth, it's, it's, it withstands everything for all times. How do you know what truth is? For me, I think that my truth, I have to look at my truth because my truth for me may not be that same truth for you. We, we can see the same experiences um, we can have the same data, we can say have the same information, but we won't agree on the same outcome. That's the thing about having data, and so I have to say what my truth is for me. My truth for me is that I want to be the best that I can be. So I believe that every day that I wake up, that I should wake up trying to help somebody. That's my truth. And so that's what the truth is for me. Now, it may be different for you with the same information. Because two people can have the same information, but arrive at a different decision. I see you smiling, so this, this interview was kind of wasn't, wasn't what you were expecting, huh? I want to transition a little bit maybe into art and then maybe we can talk a little bit about if you want to show us anything yeah otherwise, uh, well, let uh, me start with the question though if you don't mind you said it uh, they quoted you in the journal sentinel saying that everything is art and that when i'm paraphrasing this next part mm -hmm. that when you see things you see the artist you see art right whatever you see can you explain that when you see I believe that looking and seeing is not the same. They're not synonymous with one another. When people look at things, they just glance. They don't really see it. Like, oh. But in art, and I say why I say that everything is art, is because when you see, you see all of the angles. You see the rectangle. You see the square. You see the circle, you see the triangle, and that's everything in life. It's made up from them five basic shapes. Everything in life is made from five basic shapes. And those same five basic shapes creates everything. The architecture, the furniture, the cars, it comes from that artistic point of view, looking from the right side of the brain. That's what we get our art from, that creativity. If you look in this room, all you see is squares, rectangles, circles, ovals, and that's all the light. So art is more than just painting a picture. Art is about life experiences. Just like the other day, me and Miss Sherry were supposed to meet some children and they didn't show up and they didn't call. And then they, they didn't say, well, we don't want to be a part of it no more. We got busy. And, I, and me and Miss Sherry was having a discussion and we said, we need to teach our kids the value of what their word means. Of making the phone call to say, hey, I'm not coming. I can't make it, I, I, I changed my mind. Because what happens if nobody teaches them that that means something, then it forms a pattern. And so as people, we need strokes every day, be they positive or negative. We need to be strokes. But if nobody teaches them the value of their word, it's just like being late for an interview. Or you tell, you make a commitment and then you say, oh, I ain't gonna do that, right, but I ain't gonna call either. So what you do in turn is you waste other people's time. And time has value. 
And most people don't know what they're doing with their minutes. And I'll use it in, in the term minutes because there's 1,440 minutes in a day. That is 24 hours. And how many people know that there's 1,440 minutes in a day? If you approach them and say, what is 1,440 minutes? They would have to stop and think for a minute. So what are you doing with your minutes? What are you doing with that 1,440 minutes? Can you account for them? Does that register? Because every time you take a part of those 1,440 minutes and you make a commitment to somebody that you're going to do something and then you don't do it, you just wasted somebody's time. I thought about time with you because having spent 40 years in prison, how do you view time? I mean, what is time to you? How do you see that time that you were there? What does this time now mean to you? Concept of time. The time that I was there, I used it as a vehicle to educate myself, to better myself, to teach myself a trade so in case I couldn't get a job, I could eat. So I used that time to make a better me, to change my reality from being a function and literate to someone who was literate, thinking, and could respond to any situation. And now that I'm out here with that time, I'm investing that time into finishing to educate myself and give back to the community that I felt that I destroyed by selling drugs and helping some wayward kid that might be going down that same path that I went down. Just if I save one kid from that prison, from that prison mentality, I did my job. I use that time effectively. That's what time is to me. If okay. we wrap up, we can. If you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah, some I'm some gonna show you some you artwork. Tell us a little bit about it. Maybe, so, one more question. What do you want? To, what you got? Twenty-five hundred pieces of art upstairs. Ideally, where are those headed? Hopefully one day to, to be sold. So I can create another 2,500 pieces. That's the ultimate goal. I, I'm going to show you some, some... Okay, wait, wait, one second. I'm going to... Um, wait, are we going to do a house tour? With the... So I think what's going to happen is we'll take this out here. And then as you talk about your work, we can bring that with us. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab some pictures right over here right now that, okay. I, that I was taking photographs of the other okay. day. And I, I, I made the statement that I like to do abstract. That's my favorite subject. These were some pieces that I was separating from some other pieces. And this, uh, this piece here is of tomatoes and uh, basil. And that's going to New Orleans to go in the house in New Orleans. I'm going to sit these over here as I move along. But this is my favorite thing, is creating abstracts. And this is about music. You see the piano, the mandolin, you see the, the, the horns. And although they look like pipes and everything, they're actually horns. But these, in each one of these, these are out of my head. I didn't have anything to look at. I just, I just created them out of my mind. I did this in 2013, in 13. This one was done in 2010. Uh, this one was done in 2013. So I 
just made up things. I would just make things up. Who are your influences as painters? I would have to say... Artists in general. Artist-wise, I would have to say Pablo Picasso. Uh, I would have to say... Uh, uh, Jacob Lawrence. Horace Pippin. Uh, Salvador Dali, Vassal Kandinsky. I also studied art history and art theory while I was incarcerated because I didn't want to just be an artist and not know anything about any of the great masters. So I gave myself an education in that as well. I think I did this one in... Uh, as in, if, if you'll notice, uh, I signed this one, One Lock Enigma Bay. And I, because Enigma is a mystery, I don't know why I do some of the things that I do. And it's a mystery why the, that I paint the way that I paint or I create as many pieces I, as I create in so many different mediums. Now those are pastels. This one here, is a watercolor. And I did this in 2007. I love that one. And so I just I just do different things and I uh, I find myself a lot of times just painting whatever I feel. I, I never the picture never usually ends up being what I started started out as. And I did this one in 2009. Can you take one that you could explain to us somewhat what you were seeing when you painted it or when you created it? Just walk us through uh, what we're seeing. Let's, let's, let's take this one for instance. Okay, if, if you notice with most of my work, you see a lot of eyes. And the reason why I'm so enamored with eyes is because they say that the eyes are the mirrors of the soul. And so, but for me, what the eyes represent is that I'm aware, that I see, that I don't just look at things, I actually see things. So, and knowing that looking and seeing is not synonymous. On pieces like this, I felt like a clown for being in the situation that I was in after having acquired the understanding and knowledge that I was acquiring. And so a lot of my pieces are real colorful and they look like a bunch of faces interacting in there. As you'll see, here's the face here and there's the lips and stuff and then there's the face there. Then there's a face over here, the eye over there, a half a face here and a nose there and a cheek over there. See, this face here goes over here. And that's that's they they're just meshing all together. And then I have a, a bird here, I got the, the toucan or whatever you wanna call him. And so all of that is being pulled back together to get back in balance and in harmony with life and with nature. And so that's, and, and so. Can I take a photo of this? Yes, you, yes, you can. And so what happens is, is that you want to put it on the floor or somewhere. I just want to make sure my shadow is on it. Yeah. Well, you can lay it down there. Thank you. So what happens is, is that when I'm creating these pieces, I realize that with one human family and everything is intermeshed, everything is inter intertwined with another thing because nothing exists on its own. Everything needs some other system to support it in order for it to make it. So, I started to create these abstracts because they, become, they became a fusion of what was around me, uh, other people around me, how they were was, they was seeing 
things and how I was viewing things and how they were seeing my work. Now I have a show that's going to be on June the 19th at the uh, Canned Art, Art Beats on uh, National on Juneteenth. But a lot of my things are about music too because music is the, is the one thing that's universal that bridges all gaps. Everybody likes all kind of music. So no matter the genre of music, people like music. And music is one of the few things that when everything else has gone awry, that can cross all boundaries and bring us all together. You know, uh, when we look at all of the, the different projects, uh, when natural disasters have happened, we are the world. Uh, all of the musicians, usually when something happens, they get together and they give a concert and they raise funds or they do a telethon. But who do they bring to all of these telethons? They bring the one thing that crosses all boundaries for all people and all races. They bring music. It crosses everything. It crosses out all of the hatred and everything else and brings it all together. So a lot of my pieces are about music. This is an interesting piece. But you see, once again, it's about the music. Can you tell us just a little bit about who are the four individuals for singing? Well, well this, this style is called uh, pointillism, or it's just a bunch of marks and checks. But this is party time. And everybody's out to go have a good time and party. And the thing that bridges that gap, once again, is the music. So each one of these individuals, now this individual here is one individual with another individual coming out of him. So it's like he got a split personality, but most people don't see this individual over here. But there's faces, there's lips, his nose, his eyes. Let's wrap up the recording. And we'll keep gonna... we'll keep talking about this. We're gonna do some uh, shorter little clips, probably just about your art. Like if I take a picture of the okay. art. Okay. And... Yeah. So oh, um, great. I'll do the uh. The... Can we get a photo? You want I think we want to catch that one. Yeah. Can I get a photo of this? Can we... Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and then I'll I'll just do our little ending recording thing, yeah. and then we can. Get some photos and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Here, right, we'll get. So, these pictures are. I don't want to touch these. <laughs> That's okay. I just want to get my, my paper from underneath. Um, yeah. Okay, so she's going to end with a script. Just a little. Okay. Um, again, thank you so much for um, taking the time to do this interview. It was great and really inspiring. <laughs> um, so this will be added to the growing knowledge about the community and the people in the community. And um, if you have any questions, again, um, contact our director at Regent Sun and we can give you his contact information. Okay. And um, also, just so you know, for the next three Fridays at the Finney Library on Sherman and North, do you know where that is? Yes, I do. Uh, we're having um, just like an open house community review. So, okay. So community members can come in and give their input on what we're doing. And then also our final review for the project, or the final presentation also at Finney Library will be on July 21st. Okay. Um, yeah, and so I that's... Think, um, that's on July the 21st, I would be out of town. I'm oh, quite sure. Sorry. Uh, my family reunion is uh, next month in Dallas, Texas, so okay. I won't be here. Okay, that's but no problem. You, you can see a lot of my themes deal with music and eyes and horns and 
Now this one has the jail bars. And like a lot of times I would be feeling like a clown, but I would be feeling like I was missing the party, <laughs> so to speak. So I would do a lot of things. But I have post protest pictures, uh I do